The election of 2022 was brought to you by my lovely patrons Thomas Johnson, James Rapp, John Mezzo, Mike Ran, Cameron Strauss, Rudbot, Tom Smarty, ARW, Edward Pierre, Ben Hancock, and Lock and Good. For as little as three Australian dollars a month, you can get your name shouted out at the start of every Sawman video, as well as access to bonus behind the scenes content. Link in the description below. With Morrison's win in 2019, there was some relief that the chaos of the last 10 years was finally over. However, a series of crises would turn the 46th Parliament of Australia into arguably one of the most chaotic parliaments to date, in which polls would swing massively from one side to the other. Could Scott Morrison defy the polls again to become the first Prime Minister since Howard to win two straight elections, or would the Labour Party finally end nine years of coalition rule? Following the election of 2019, things would quiet down a lot in Canberra. Still reeling from their shock defeat, the Labour Party would have to choose a new leader. Several candidates would consider the role, but with the shock of the 2019 election defeat, none felt like they could lead the party into government. Thus they all backed out, leaving one Anthony Norman Albanese to become the 21st leader of the Labour Party by default. Albanese, or Albo as I like to call him, would be born in 1963 Darlinghurst, Sydney, as the child of a single mother. As the child of a single mother, Albanese would have a rough childhood growing up in social housing, which would strongly influence his later political views on welfare support. Eventually, Albanese would attend the University of Sydney, where he would get involved with the Student Council and the Labour Party's left faction. Upon finishing university, Albanese would slowly move up the ranks of the Labour Party, eventually becoming senior advisor to New South Wales Premier Bob Carr. In 1996, Albanese would win pre-selection for the seat of Grandler, but would face a strong challenge from the No Aircraft Noise Party, who attempted to shut down the expansion of a third runway at the nearby Sydney Kingswood Smith Airport. Despite fears of an upset, Albanese would win and would go on to become quite a progressive member of parliament, supporting things such as the right of homosexual couples to access superannuation. Albanese would continue to work his way up the shadow cabinet before becoming Minister of Transport and Infrastructure in Rudd's government. During the leadership struggles between Rudd and Gillard, Albanese would become a very vocal critic of the way Rudd was deposed, going on to say, I, uh, I like fighting Tories. That's what I do. That's what I do. I have despaired in recent days, as I have watched Labor's legacy in government be devalued. In 2013, Albanese would help in getting Rudd back into office, and in return he would be promoted to Deputy Prime Minister. Following the 2013 election, Albanese would narrowly lose the leadership to Shorten, and would go back to the infrastructure and transport portfolio, until finally getting the leadership in 2019. As leader, Albanese would attempt to distance the Labour Party away from its controversial negative gearing and franking credit policies, and instead take a small target approach. This meant only attacking the government over its slip-ups, rather than the large full-scale attacks that had been seen over the last six years. The result of this left Parliament quite the quiet place, however it would not last as 2019 came to an end. Around the end of 2019, Australia would be hit by one of the largest bushfire seasons ever due to soaring temperatures and low rainfall. This put a renewed focus on addressing climate change, which was believed to be one of the biggest factors in causing the blazes. This made life difficult for the coalition government, who had won the previous election on the back of coal jobs. However, the biggest controversy would occur in late December, during the height of the blazes. With so much of Australia burning, people began to look to the Prime Minister to address the situation. However, Morrison was nowhere to be seen. Despite repeated calls, the Prime Minister's office refused to comment on Morrison's whereabouts. It wasn't until pictures were leaked online of Morrison relaxing in Hawaii that the Prime Minister finally chose to react to the current crisis occurring back in Australia. Morrison would return to a furious Australian public, who accused the Prime Minister of shirking his responsibilities in the middle of a crisis. His attempts at damage control would only make things worse, we would go on to say the following in a radio interview. They know that uh, you know I, I don't hold a hose, mate, and I, I don't sit yeah. in the control room. This just infuriated Australians even more. And this anger was shown for the world to see when Morrison visited the small town of Cabago. During the visit, Morrison would be heckled by the locals who accused the Prime Minister of only being there for publicity and not to help. Scott Morrison's handling of the bushfires had been a total PR disaster, and both he and his government would tank in the polls. Accusations soon arose that the Prime Minister cared more about his own image rather than Australians' livelihood, and once again it looked like the coalition was heading for an electoral wipeout. However, a series of events coming out of China would completely turn this election on its head. In 2019, a new variant of the SARS coronavirus was discovered in the city of Wuhan, China. 
Due to its high transmissibility, the virus quickly turned into an endemic in China and later a global pandemic, as cases began to appear across the planet. In response, the government began to implement border controls and lockdown measures to prevent the spread of the disease. However, debate began to grow between the majority Labour-led state governments and the coalition-led federal government on how to handle the pandemic. The federal government desired a containment plan which would see the virus slowly transmit through the community, such that hospitals could manage cases. Meanwhile, most states desired an elimination plan which would see extreme lockdown measures taken in order to totally eliminate the virus from the community. Despite protests from the federal government, the elimination strategy would be implemented and would initially be highly successful in keeping Australia relatively COVID-free compared to other nations. Despite not being the one responsible for the COVID management, Morrison would still get a lot of praise and would in turn see his own approval rating rise to once again be above water. This would also coincide with the coalition once again winning the two party preferred polls and look like the disaster of the 2019 bushfires were over. However, 2021 would end up being another disaster year for the coalition. In February that year, the first batches of the COVID-19 vaccines arrived and would begin to be distributed into the community. However, it soon became quickly apparent that Australia's vaccination rate was well behind that of other developed nations like the UK and Israel. The government would take a lot of blame for this so-called stroller due to accusations that they had not properly secured enough supplies. The vaccine stroll-up wouldn't be the government's only problematic issue, as in February 2021, junior Liberal staffer Brittany Higgins would come out to the press that in early 2019 she had been raped by another staff member in the Office of Defence Industry Minister, Senator Linda Reynolds. Accusations soon came to light that Reynolds and other members of the government had attempted to cover up the incident due to the upcoming election that year. The fallout from this incident would bring to light multiple cases of inappropriate sexual behaviour occurring in Parliament. One of the most high profiles of these cases would be levelled against Attorney General Christian Porter, who had apparently raped a 16-year-old girl back in 1988. While the validity of these claims were never proven due to the victim taking their own life in 2020, the incident would cause a massive protest against the coalition government to address workplace safety for women. It was during one of these protests outside Parliament House that Morrison would go on the record comparing the protests outside with those occurring in Myanmar who had just experienced a coup. This is a triumph of democracy. Not far from here, such marches even now are being met with bullets. But not here in this country, Mr Speaker. Not here in this country. These comments were received extremely poorly, and combined with other problems facing the government, the coalition would once again find their poll numbers tanking. As the election approached, things were not looking good for the coalition as they began to poll more and more behind the Labour Party. Unhappy with the current state of affairs, former Nationals leader Barnaby Joyce would move to challenge the current leader Michael McCormack, successfully regaining the position of Nationals leader in June 2021. This made Joyce the first ever Nationals MP to lead the party twice on the federal level. If internal coups weren't the only issue, Morrison also had to deal with multiple MPs spreading conspiratorial material on both TV and social media. Most prolific of these was Hughes MP Craig Kelly, who took aim at the current bout of COVID vaccines, claiming that they had major health risks that the government was covering up. Despite Morrison resisting calls to kick him out of the party, Kelly would eventually leave on his own accord, leaving the coalition on a bare majority of 76 seats. Kelly would go on to join Clive Palmer's United Australia Party, which would attempt to make a comeback following his poor performance in the 2019 election. Teaming up, Kelly and Palmer would run on a platform of rallying against COVID measures such as lockdown and vaccine mandates. Such a platform drew a lot of criticism from mainstream sources, who accused the UAP of undermining Australia's somewhat successful attempts at stopping COVID-19. By the start of 2022, the coalition looked to be facing a certain defeat in that year's election, and murmurs began to grow whether Morrison would resign as leader before then. However, as the man who had steered the coalition out of one electoral defeat, a lot of coalition supporters were convinced that Morrison could do it again. With the confidence that he could pull off a second election miracle, Morrison would call the election for the 21st of May 2022, and with that the campaign was on. Hoping to avoid the controversies of last time, Albanese would run on a very small focused policy agenda, promising to introduce an anti-corruption commission along with a modest increase to Australia's carbon reduction rate compared to that of the coalition. This drew criticism from the Greens, now under the leadership of MP Adam Bant, as well as other groups who wanted more ambitious targets. As a result, a large group of independent candidates, including current MPs Andrew Wilkie, Helen Haynes, Rebecca Sharkey and Zali Stigel, would band together to run under a united message to push for more climate action, called Climate 200, using the colour teal in a lot of their ads. These so-called teal independents, while not an official party, would pose a massive threat to the coalition. With funding from billionaire Simon Holmes the court, several of these teal independents would soon take aim at the so-called liberal moderates with hopes of winning their safe blue ribbon seats. 
As the election approached, both leaders looked to be in trouble. Albanese was facing criticism for a series of gaffes he had made during the campaign trail, and for seemingly having little policy to promote. Morrison, meanwhile, was facing criticism for a strong army of multiple electorates, putting forward his own political allies to run in those seats against the wishes of the local branches. He was also facing an issue of trust due to his actions over the last three years. Despite the campaign mostly focusing on domestic issues, concern would soon be raised internationally when the nearby Solomon Islands would enter into a security pact with the People's Republic of China, potentially allowing the Asian superpower to dock warships on Australia's doorstep. Labour accused the coalition of not supporting Pacific neighbours and thus pushing them over to China's side. Another issue would also be raised on election day when the government leaked information that the Australian border force had intercepted a vessel carrying Sri Lankan refugees with hopes that it would bring back the 2013 concerns about border security. And the winner was? As voting began to be counted, the results looked very unclear as a record number of people chose to vote third party over Labour or the coalition. However, by the end of the night, one thing was very clear. With the loss of 19 seats, Scott Morrison had been defeated. With only 58 seats and 35.7% of the first preferences, this was the worst result the coalition had seen since Curtin's 1943 landslide. In fact, the Liberals had lost so many seats that for the first time in the party's history, the Liberals no longer represented the absolute majority of the party, being outnumbered by the Nationals and Liberal Nationals 31 to 27. Of the 19 seats lost, 7 of them would be Liberal stronghold seats held by the party for years, which fell to the Teal Independents who had gained support from the moderates in the electorate unhappy with the coalition's views on climate change and other progressive issues. The most high profile of these seats had to be Kuyong, where Treasurer and future party leader hopeful Josh Frydenberg would be defeated by paediatric neurologist Dr Monique Ryan. Another high profile loss would be Zed Selja, who would lose the ACT's second Senate spot to former rugby star David Pocock. This meant that the coalition had lost all representation in the Australian Capital Territory. With the coalition's utter destruction, it had become clear that Anthony Albanese and Labour had won, but the final result looked unclear. Despite assumptions that the party had bottomed out in the first preferences at the last election, the party was shocked to face a 0.76% swing against them. Despite the hidden preferences, Labour would benefit from a strong flow of second preferences, and after days of counting, would eventually win a slim majority of 77 seats, identical to what the coalition had won back in 2019. Arguably the biggest winner in this election had to be third parties, who not only received 31.72% of all votes counted, but also 16 seats to create the largest crossbench since the end of the three-party era in 1909. Big winners of this new crossbench would be the Greens under Adam Bant, who had quadrupled their representation in the lower house by picking up three seats in Brisbane. They would also gain three seats in the Senate, giving the party 12 senators, their biggest win in the upper house too. Another winner would be Jackie Lambie, who gained a second senator in Tasmania. Most interesting of the third party victories had to be the United Australia Party. While Craig Kelly would lose his seat of Hughes in a landslide, Ralph Babbitt would successfully win the sixth senate seat in Victoria. While not originally expecting to rush into power the day after the election, Albanese would be forced to get sworn in on Monday, as a quad meeting would be occurring between the nations of Australia, America, India and Japan in Tokyo. As a result, just like Whitlam, Albanese would lead a small five-man government for the first few days of his prime ministership before counting it even finished. Now back in power again, Albanese and Labour would have to oversee a very different government that had not really been seen since the 1900s, as a record number of independents looked to tear down the two-party system. Will the third parties be able to succeed, or will Labour and the Coalition be able to regain their voters? Come back next time for what I presume is the election of 2025. The election of 2022 is brought to you by my lovely patrons, Thomas Johnson. The election of 2022 was brought to you